the mainstream Asian American narrative has nothing to do with the vast majority of Asian Americans in this country, right? And that the vast majority of Asian Americans in this country don't even know what the term Asian American means, right? Like, uh, and that includes people like my parents. Like, I don't think my parents have ever used the term Asian American. They refer to themselves as Korean. Sometimes they refer to themselves as American. Uh, I don't think they've ever said they're Korean American, <laughs> and nor have, and Asian American is some just weird concept to them. And so it's an interesting book in that it is a book that I think argues quite forcefully, I hope, against like this type of like uh, kind of I don't know how to put it, but like progressive identity politics, right? Like where I think like none of it is really true. Um, at the same time, while trying to understand what Asianness means. to welcome to the podcast someone I've admired from afar for a long time since his Grantland days, author, journalist. His newest book is The Loneliest Americans, Jay Caspian Kang. Welcome, Jay. Thank you. That's like, I think that's the most enthusiastic introduction I've ever I've had in my life. So thank well, you. Well, that's that. what we're all about here. <laughs> Setting new, new <laughs> heights, high water marks for enthusiasm. But uh, I did become a fan of yours during the Grantland days. And when Grantland shut down, I was heartbroken. I was like, this shit had better come back. <laughs> and then, and then it came back. But I don't think you were part of the comeback, right? It got kind of turned into the ringer and you weren't there. Is that all right? Yeah, I left like uh, even before the sort of, you know, tragic end of Grantland. I think I had been gone for a couple of years by then. But I was definitely, the, I imagine that you were a, that what you read was some of the stuff about Jeremy Lin. Yes. And that was, uh, <laughs> I was like, unless you're, unless you're a really big fan of like NBA betting or something like that, it was probably the Jeremy Lin stuff. But yeah, I was there through Lin Sanity and, um, I don't know. It was cool. Like, uh, you know, Bill, Bill Simmons, who was a guy, you know, the person who was running the site gave us a lot of freedom and, uh, I don't know. And wanted us to write about things that we, were excited by and so I don't know who wasn't excited by Linsanity I think back on it and I'm like were those the best two weeks of my life those are the best two weeks <laughs> you know? of a lot of our lives uh, you know it was it like three Sports yeah. Illustrated covers in a row like the whole thing was madness <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah yeah I went to the um I went to the game in the garden like uh they were nice enough to fly me out from LA to New York and it was when he was going up against uh Kobe yeah Kobe yeah. Yeah, and he scored like 38 points against Kobe. And I was like about to cry in the middle of the game. You know, and I was like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> you know, how many of these basketball games have I been to? I'm sitting here like trying to hold back tears. I was like, I couldn't understand it. But yeah, it was a, it was a full emotional experience. It was my dream to be the backup point guard for the New York Knicks growing up. Um, and even in my fantasies, I couldn't force myself to make it starter. <laughs> it was like, hey, look, that's that, uh, you know, that's that internalized, right, oppression. <laughs> it's like, I can't be the starter, but maybe I could be a backup. You and Fauci must have had the same well, dream. Well, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us would have had that dream. But the Jeremy right. outdid my dream and... Uh, took the city by storm and he actually that led to my breakup with the New York Knicks Jay I don't know if you know this about me, but I I grew up in the suburbs oh, yeah, of New York and was this, like a yeah. huge fan and then after uh, we Dumped Jeremy Lina essentially or you know, let him go to the Rockets uh, I was like fuck this shit. I just can't handle this anymore like <laughs> it was, uh, like, like losing our golden child over money of all things I mean if the Knicks did one thing right in their uh, history is just fucking spend money on losers, you know, <laughs> like like Jerome James got a fat contract, like anyone got a fat contract from the team. Huh. And then the, the guy who we all loved, uh, who revived the season and, and made, you know, like made my wife like, you know, excited about basketball for the first time in our lives. Like we, we let him go. I was like, I just can't handle this anymore. Yeah, it was like over like 14 million dollars or something like that. And it, yeah, I remember being mad, too, because it's like. Like, even if you're not doing it from a basketball standpoint, you guys are terrible, you know? So, like, what's the basketball standpoint? At least have somebody in here who 
will draw fans in and make them excited and you know and even if he's bad at least it'll make them think about the team you know but um i don't know james dolan is james is the worst is the worst and you know it, it was hard for me to like Mello after that um you know a lot of jeremy lynn fans turned on carmelo because uh, he kind of was running the team at the time uh so I, I feel like you were part of history you were the most prominent sports journalist documenting the insanity and i have to ask how the heck you got started as a writer in large part because i'm going to confess uh i think you and i have a bunch of things in common but when i was a kid i thought i might want to be a writer or i did want to be a writer um, I showed up to college and I studied English for one semester and fucking hated it. It was like, you know, we read Mole Flanders or some shit. And I was like, this is the worst thing ever. So I then, like drifted <laughs> off immediately and was like, all right, I guess I'll, you know, take an economics course and uh, the rest of it. And, and then I went to law school where everyone there actually was someone who wanted to be a writer at some point and had, uh, you know, didn't have the guts to pursue it. For the most part, and they just went to law school, you know, because it seemed more practical. Um, so, so that that was a bit of my arc, <laughs> and so like I admire the heck out of people that actually managed to make a career out of something that so many people think about, particularly if you're Asian, because we have all these pressures to do something eminently practical. Right. Uh, well, you know, I think it's a strange story in that you know I think my mother. Uh, I don't know what, you know, I've talked to her about it, but she, I, she always wanted to be a writer, but she immigrated to the United States when she was, you know, in her 20s. And so it's hard to become a, a writer when you're, um, you know, you're in a country that you're not speaking your native language anymore. And so um, she did a lot of, she sort of, I think, placed a lot of that stuff on me and my sister when we were little kids. And, you know, it was almost like a tiger mom thing where she would, make us write a page a day every single day. I think starting when we were like four and a half or five years old, I still have all these books and she would like give us these notebooks and we'd have to write and read every single day. And I think that basically went until I was 16 years old. And so, I don't know, I had sort of this tiger mom training <laughs> on how to be a writer. And I will just say that all that practice sort of made things easier, but um, yeah, that's sort of where it got started. And I don't know. I think luckily I, I really liked it. You know, if I had resisted, I think I wouldn't have I wouldn't have done it as a career. But I think the start of it is in that. Period. I just did the math, man. If you wrote a page a day uh, for 12 years, I mean, you had like, you know, four or five thousand pages of, I'm sure, utter nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Do, yeah, I go back. <laughs> it's It's ridiculous. It's like so the only, you know, it's like, oh, we had this for dinner, you know, and this happened at school and it's just like totally dispassionate except the days when I like would have a little league game or something like that. And then I would fill up like several pages with like explanations. I would make box scores and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, most of it is just nonsense, right? Like it's just like, <laughs> uh, I played with so and Rob, you know, and Rob and I played Nintendo and then his mom told us to stop. And then I came home and ate dinner <laughs> and then just strung out over a page. <laughs> So you get into journalism, uh, Grantland, New York Times. You wind up doing uh, a beat for Vice around um, civil rights protests, police brutality specifically. Right. Uh, I mean, what, that, that was like a pretty big transition. I remember in your book, you talk about how uh, you were making a transition to video or TV. And they were like, don't worry, it's just yeah. like writing. Uh, just be a more animated version of yourself. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was weird. I mean, yeah, I, I went, I mean, I was, did sort of, I spent my 20s basically not publishing anything. I wanted to be a novelist and things were really not working out. So I mostly played poker and surfed and taught English in high school for like eight years, just getting rejection after rejection. And then, you know, a lot of stuff happened at once. I got very lucky and then I ended up at Grayland. But um, yeah, the television part of it was after I had sort of been like, I don't know if I want to really write anymore. And I did a little bit of work in advertising. And then someone was starting a show on HBO, you know, a vice show on HBO about the news. And they asked me if I wanted to audition for being like a television correspondent. And I was like, I was like, are you sure? <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. You know, like, I never thought of myself as someone who could be on television. 
<laughs> just like, I like mostly like, you know, like lie down and, you know, type in, type into my phone. I was like, I'm not like an animated person, you know, but, um, they seemed pretty committed and they seemed pretty convinced that I would be good at it. Now, I, I think that they were wrong. You know? <laughs> like, I think I was right about it, but I don't, you know, I don't know. I really liked sort of being a TV correspondent just because the, the days were, uh, interesting, right? Like you're working on a team. I mean, you, you've done some of this yeah. before, right? Like, but like for us, it was just like, we would, we would fly to like St. Louis or we would fly to, we would fly to Minneapolis or we'd fly to like Grand Rapids, Michigan or something like that. We'd stay in like, you know, like a double tree and then we would, you know, it felt like I was part of a team, which was much less sort of isolating than being a writer. And I enjoyed that part of it. Like I loved working with my colleagues and stuff. I just didn't really like being on camera. Well, this made it into your book. Uh, and again, it's an extraordinary book, The Loneliest Americans. This is what it looks like. But, but I was fascinated <laughs> by your description of what it's like to report on the protests that followed, for example, uh, shooting uh, of a black person in one of these communities. And so you would show up uh, and it, it did sound very, very... Um, Action packed. Certainly, I'm sure there was like uh, a lot of teamwork involved because you'd be with a camera person and a producer. Uh, you experienced getting tear gassed multiple times. Uh, and one of the things that you say yeah. in your book that really uh, it, it uh, captured me was you talk about there's like a pattern to the way that you would cover these stories where you would have a quote from a law enforcement figure or some kind of official a quote from an activist, uh, and then ideally a quote from the victim's family, uh, and that your assignment in many cases was to try and track these people down as quickly as possible. Right, right. I mean, you know, it's part of the sort of unsavory part about being a reporter, right? which is that sometimes you have to talk to people who don't want to talk to you. Sometimes you have to sort of parse through things that are being said to you that you know are lies, right? Um, and sometimes you have to uh, you know, deal with people who have just under gone through the worst tragedy, sort of an unthinkable tragedy uh, that that you can't even really conceptualize right in your head, um, you know. And so uh, and yet, like, it's so rote, like you have to do those steps or else you're not doing your job. I actually think those steps are good. Like, that's what reporters should do. That's what the public deserves to know. And so um, you try and fine tune that a bit, right? Like you try and figure out what strategies work. I don't know how many of these things I, I, I think I probably between, you know, writing for the New York Times and, and then this job at, at Vice, I don't know, maybe I went to 50 um, separate protests, maybe more, you know, and uh, it's expected to sort of have a story for every single one of them. And, uh, you know, you try not to get cynical about it. You try not to get burned out about it. And so, so basically most of your head is spent trying to like fine tune your process and trying to do this, right? And um, yeah, you got to sort of figure out when activists are telling you the truth, when the police are telling you the truth, you know, that's much more important. You have to figure out what activists actually know things, which, which ones don't, right? Like there's a lot of wild goose chase type of stuff where someone will promise that they can help you talk to X person, right? But that person is not really, <laughs> like doesn't actually know. Um, and so, yeah, you got to you just like slowly learn the how these things are very similar in different cities. And then and then it starts to feel a bit repetitive. Right. Like you um, you go and then you're trying to make sense of this tragedy. And then at the same time, you know, you're just thinking, wow, this is just like this is just like Charlotte. You know, like this is just like Baton Rouge. And uh, I don't know, it both reinforces the violence that's happening. Uh, and, uh, and also just how many of these communities are getting traumatized by, by this violence. We all do it. We all take number twos. And then the question is, what happens after? Around the world, when you need to wipe, you actually don't wipe. You use water. You use something called a bidet. Here in the US, we're a little bit behind the curve on a number of things, and one of them is the way we take care of the basics. If you order Tushy, it's like a bidet that connects 
to your everyday household toilet. It's cleaner, it's better for the environment, it's more effective, it's modern, it's European, it's Asian, it's sustainable. It really is like an upgrade. It's one reason why I'm very happy to be sponsored by Tushy. Give the gift of cleanliness to yourself or your loved ones this holiday season and get 10% off plus free shipping right now at hellotushy.com slash yang. You can tag them at hellotushy on social media so they can help celebrate. That's hellotushy.com slash yang for 10% off and free shipping, cleaner, more environmentally friendly. You know, you can't go wrong. Your book had a lot of things that I'd never seen before. Uh, and well, one of it, one of the things you wrote up about attending these protests is you talked about how uh, you didn't like a lot of activists because it seemed like they were forced into roles and, and it, it kind of made them seem uh, a bit like performers to you, which was fascinating to me. And, and, and that there's like a speaking circuit that follows and then some people get absorbed into the speaking circuit, but then others don't. And then the ones that don't get absorbed uh, feel kind of left out and embittered, uh, and then the ones that do uh, continue to to make a living essentially because it, there's there is like an ecosystem uh, to activism. And recently there was this brouhaha you probably saw where there was going to be a reality TV show called The Activist, and, and then people just shouted it down. Oh, yeah, what was that about? <laughs> yeah, that seemed like the worst idea of it, all it, time. It clearly yeah. seemed like the worst oh. idea of all time. So those are people who don't even know what I'm talking about. There was a reality TV show where there was going to be an activism competition. Uh, and the, whoever won got to like go to Davos or something or like present it to, to, to. Right. They, it was literally they went to Davos, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but your, yours was uh, the first account where it actually talked about how uh, various activists uh, would would try to. Uh, make the case in different ways and show up at the protests. And then some of them wound up being professionalized and others didn't. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I want to make a distinction here, which is that the reason why I kept going to these protests wasn't because it was just my job. I mean, I could have asked to be on a different beat, you know, or I could have just not done this job. The reason I went was because I've always been very moved by the thought of people walking out of their houses, just normal citizens walking out and engaging in, in an act of unified dissent. You know, I think it's the most important thing that Americans can do. And, you know, I come, uh, I was born in Korea. Korea is a country that protests all the time, right? It's like the one thing that Koreans do, right? I think that we're sort of known more for other things at this point, but like, you know, the sort of the unifying experience of people my parents' age, for example, in Korea is that they just went to a lot of protests. And so there's two sides of me that, that sort of appreciate this. And, um, but yeah, there are, like when trying to decipher this, like as a reporter, the people who are going to appoint themselves as spokespeople are sometimes not the people who have just walked out of their houses, right? Who have sort of been fed up. You know, this is like the fifth time, sixth time, tenth time they've seen someone shot by the police in, in this neighborhood over the years and they're, they're just fed up, right? Like I think those people, um, some of those people do end up being leaders, right? Some of those people do end up taking leadership roles. And I think that like when that happens, generally that it's fine. But there also is a sort of professional class of activists. And I not I don't I think that say that I don't like them is a little bit too strong, but it's difficult to interview them sometimes, right? Because they just have talking points and they sort of blow through them. Um, and in the end you don't have anything that's particularly relevant to the story at hand, right? It is it is just a lot of sort of uh, stuff that almost feels abstract when you talk to the when you talk to them. And so um, yeah, I wouldn't say that that it's a dislike of those people. I think some of those people do end up doing good things, but certainly the the class of activists that you are talking about, right? Like the the sort of professionalized media savvy ones uh, are are present. And honestly, at the beginning of my career, when I far, first started uh, reporting on this, like I wasn't really like I, I I made some mistakes where I wasn't really thoughtful about that, you know, where um, where maybe I like talked to some people who I thought were, who ended up, you know, sort of being in that type of class. But at the same time, I think about it now and I just like, well, but when I met them, they weren't, you know? And so it's, it's a process that sort of happens. And, you know, some people think that they can do more good if they have a bigger platform. And then some people stay rooted in the community. 
And sometimes that's great. And we all want, you know, like, I think that's the option that people would instinctively say is better. But at the same time, you know, like, it's, it's important to have a big platform and say some things too. So uh, I, I don't, I feel somewhat ambivalent about it, right? Like, I just think, but I don't think that the I don't think that the phenomenon that you're describing is is not true. It's really tough, Jay, because I, you know, I, I've been a public figure. I've been uh, someone who tried to make things happen. And when I was running my nonprofit that I'd founded, the organization demanded that I go to conferences where people had money. And I get in a panel and I try right. and, you know, be in front of everyone and, and talk up the mission and whatnot. Uh, and it, it seemed like the resources were pulling me in one direction and then the work, however you define it, was pulling me in the other direction. Um, but I'm a right. goal-oriented uh, math guy. And so I was like, all right, let, let, let's go get the resources, like the best thing I can do. <laughs> and so like, I, I feel really bad for <laughs> folks because that that's the tug of war that they get pulled in. Oftentimes, uh, you know, all these kind of glitzy seeming opportunities come up. You're like, oh, if I go there, then I'll be around people who can really help move my organization forward. And then you go there and I got to say, it is the worst feeling because the, the rich people there, it's not like they run around just like doling out checks to folks. <laughs> right. They make, they make you, they make you dance a little bit, right? Yeah. There's this whole kabuki element <laughs> or, or, to it. Yeah. And they're just like, Oh, you know, really impressed right. with your work. Let's get together, call my people. And then you like call their people. And sometimes they have an officer, you know, it's like, it is like this entire, uh, ecosystem really a marketplace i mean that's one of the problems in american life is that at this point there is a marketplace for activism and you know that's why one reason why that reality tv show cracked me up so much i mean you know and then people found it like super objectionable <laughs> yeah uh, it did seem to be rooted in some sort of id you know where it's like okay why don't we just go full bore here <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it's dark it's like, i mean it, so it, maybe some it of is dark was, but, I, yeah, but i've been very dark you know in right. some ways my, myself i mean as a nonprofit leader you're you're in some ways a professional activist um so this book makes a lot of very very big arguments and points uh it does it in such an unflinching way that I've never seen before. Uh, what drove you to write this book? What was the process? Uh, you'd written a novel before that hammered away at some of the same themes, but this is a book of nonfiction. Um, yeah, like what was your, did you have like a clear vision uh, or uh, mission? And what was the process like putting this book together? Because, you know, it's a real, it's a really impressive piece of work and must have taken you quite some time. Yeah, it took me about four to five years to write. Um, you know, I took a couple breaks in there, but yeah, I think it was it was a long time, longer than I expected. Um, I, you know, like I have been writing about Asian issues for about a decade, right? Or like, uh, and you know, like you said, it started with sports, right? It started with Jeremy Lin, uh, the first piece I think I ever published anywhere. I, I published for free, and it was about Jeremy Lin when he was at Harvard and like the rapper. Jin the MC. Do you remember that guy from Freestyle Friday? Of course, MC Jin, man. I'm friends with him. <laughs> okay. And I actually went and saw, you know, MC Jin did uh, Yang for New York rap. You must have seen that shit. Right? No, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that. And he that, did yeah. a bunch of yeah. presidential stuff for me, too. So anyone can Google uh, Andrew Yang, MC Jin, all this stuff comes up. But I, I was hip to Jeremy Lin when he was still in college at Harvard. I went and saw a college game of his. So that, that just goes to show. Did you did you watch the Freestyle Friday stuff when it happened with with Jim? No, no. I just heard the you know the that the Chinese rapper uh -huh. came and you know went undefeated and got a record <laughs> deal and the, all the rest of yeah. it. And you know his first song came out was I think Speak Chinese. <laughs> Speak Chinese, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Wyclef produced it. Um, yeah, I so I had started there and I I didn't really know what I was going to do as a writer and honestly like at the time I wasn't particularly interested in writing about identity or anything like that like I just, well, just well I just like, want to oh, intercede know, man this a is a book about identity from someone who didn't want to write about identity which is one reason why I really enjoyed it but continue <laughs> yeah well I knew and uh so, so I had a couple ideas when I started writing it the first was that I want I had been writing about this population and don't been doing a lot of uh reporting in immigrant neighborhoods at the time right and so I realized that there was this big disconnect between the way that people like me Right. Or even you. Right. Like who are you and I have a lot in uh, common background wise. Children. So sure, man. Let me in for sure. Yeah. Right. Right. So like sort of first uh, people who were raised in the United States, uh, sort of in 
places that were mostly white or were mostly white and black, right, in my case. Um, and that sort of had to form this identity almost by themselves, like in isolation. And that, you know, one of the things that you learn is that you learn how to sort of deal with rich white people, right? Like you learn how to talk their talk, you learn how to sort of ingratiate yourself into their circles. And those people end up being, and then you end up going to an elite school and then you sort of graduate and then you become one of the people who is able to sort of occupy a position of messaging and power within that community. Now, the reality of it is that you may have absolutely no connection with that community at all, but just because you look like them, you become their spokespeople, right? And so um, while it, reporting in all these immigrant communities and also, you know, all my cousins sort of grew up in these enclaves too, so I was very close with them. I always knew what they were hip to. So in the end, I was just like, there's such a big disconnect between these two, right? Like the mainstream Asian American narrative has nothing to do with the vast majority of Asian Americans in this country, right? And that the vast majority of Asian Americans in this country don't even know what the term Asian American means, right? Like, uh, and that includes people like my parents. Like, I don't think my parents have ever used the term Asian American. They refer to themselves as Korean. Sometimes they refer to themselves as American. Uh, I don't think they've ever said they're Korean American, <laughs> and nor have, and Asian American is some just weird concept to them, right? So. Um, and, and my parents are pretty assimilated, right? Like it, they're not, they're not people who, uh, you know, they speak English, they, they understand the concept of Asian American, but, um, it's not something that's real to them. And so it's an interesting book in that it is a book that I think argues quite forcefully, I hope against like this type of like, uh, kind of, I don't know how to put it, but like progressive identity politics, right? Like it, where I think like none of it is really true. <laughs> Um, at the same time, while trying to understand what Asianness means, right? Like, what does it mean? Because it certainly is a category, right? Like, you and I are both Asian. Um, no one would deny that. Neither of us would deny it. But I don't know. A lot of times, I think that, like, you and I, I, I would imagine from, you know, I, this is the first time we've spoken, but I certainly have followed your career. We know some people in common. It's just like, you know, I feel very ambivalent about the about the identity. I, I, I assume you do, too. Well, you put it in such simple terms that uh, I think most people can understand. And this is the quote is, we know we don't have it as bad as you, uh, i.e. black people, but we also aren't white and we need a way to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. That's the that's sort of the realization I think a lot of Asian people come to, usually in college, right? Uh, I think that's when it sort of happens for a lot of people. But um or maybe in your early 20s if you don't go to college, but you sort of have this understanding that like you're trying to place yourself in the black-white binary in America, right? And um, I don't think many Asian people like actually want to become white, you know, where they're like, oh, I wish I had blonde hair and blue eyes and stuff. Um, and so you're just like, okay, I'm not white, you know? And, uh, but like, I, I don't, I understand that my life in a lot of ways is easier than it would be for if I was black. And so I think that's sort of the contradiction or the, you know, like sort of the two poles that people fight against their, you know, their whole lives, really. Yeah, you, you talk about how uh, America has a black, white binary race construction, which I think a lot of people recognize, and that uh, Asian Americans get torn between either associating with white liberals uh, uh, or as black people uh, and the oppressed minority. Um, but aren't really accepted by either group, <laughs> truly. Uh, and, and that's the premise for the title of your book, The Loneliest Americans, is like, look, we don't belong in either camp. Uh, and trying to belong in either camp is kind of a fail. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah, that's the general idea. And, you know, like one of the things that like my own life was basically spent uh, because I grew up mostly in North Carolina. And North Carolina has a lot of white people. It has a lot of black people, right? And so uh, my childhood was spent with a lot of white kids and a lot of black kids. And um, for most of my childhood, I identified much more with black kids uh, at the schools that I went to, to the point where, like, when I was, I, mean, I saw a photo of you when you were in high school, right? Like, <laughs> with, the <laughs> with the long hair and everything like that, right? Like, so I had a version of that where I was wearing, like, Timberlands and, you know, like, wearing, like, Mark Echo hoodies and, just only listening to rap, right? And so, and I still think there's part of me that that is grounded in that type of identification. But when you think about it, right? Like it was like, uh, 
you know, like it was an isolated identification, right? I had friends who were black, but I wasn't like, it wasn't like I had fully inhabited that or knew of the culture very well. You know, I was doing the type of thing that young people often do, which is a type of appropriation. Oh, um, uh, Jay, I just want to speak and, to interject because like yeah. what happened with me growing up in a predominantly white area with very few black people or Asian people. Um, right. But if you're a, a, a boy, uh, you just want to be respected as like a male. Uh, and I think that black culture and hip hop um, was the exemplar of essentially non-white masculinity. And so if you're an Asian kid, like one way you could be kind of masculine is to be hard and listen to rap and hip hop and, you know, like uh, wear the gear and stuff like that. At least that, that was my uh, in interpretation of it, where I also listened to a lot of rap and hip hop and the rest of it, because, you know, I, I just wanted to be tough. Like I felt like my masculinity was always in question. What what did you listen to? Well, you know, I'm a little bit older than you, so this is like when Public Enemy first came out right. and stuff like that. Uh, and then right, I, right, you know, right, Ice T. Right. right. Um, um. So it was that, but I also listened to, um, uh, like grunge and alternative and, and that stuff because that that was right. you know pretty dominant. I guess it was the '90s, so those were like the two major uh, strains. It was like the Tupac, Biggie, hip hop strain, and then there was like the Nirvana, Pearl Jam. Um, and you saw my high school photos. So you saw that, you know, I, I definitely listened to some grunge and <laughs> the, 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 the alternative thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but uh, I had a lot yeah. of anger. Uh, and so, you know, the anger, if, if you were non-white and you wanted to be tough, like it, it meant uh, essentially, in my mind, blackness at the time, because there was, there was certainly no depiction of like Asian American masculinity <laughs> to, to be had. Right, right, right. It's interesting. Kids now have it, I guess. Right. But in a way that feels so foreign to me, I want, you know, does it feel foreign to you? Like, I guess I, I sometimes think about it and I see like, uh, you know, I see these TikToks and it's like these like white kids in Indiana and they're trying to learn how to speak Korean because they're in love with like a BTS member, you know? And I was just like, what is that like? You know, what would have that been like for me in high school if like a bunch of, of white kids were trying to learn how to speak Korean and were like, you know, be like, oh my God, are you Korean? That's so cool. You know, so I think that for kids today, it's like, uh, it might be a little bit different. But for me, it was like, I, it's just like mind blowing to even think about that. <laughs> it's like, why, like, why would you learn how to speak Korean? I'll tell you um, about one of the, the, the funnest the times on the presidential trail. And this was funny. It was a day off for me. I was back in New York City. It was a day off. I was with my right. wife and her cousin. And then he just looks up and randomly and says, Rich Brian is in town. He's uh, doing a concert. You know Rich Brian, the, the rapper? Right, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. And so yeah. I was like, oh, I'm friendly with him on Twitter. Um, and then uh, he was like, do you want to try and go by the concert? And I was like, sure. So then like, I, I ping Rich and I'm just like, hey, uh, you know, I'm in town. Uh, he's like, yeah, come on by. So I end up going to the concert with uh, my wife and uh, our cousin and, and my brother-in-law. And we go backstage and then we arrange it with Rich Brian where I'm just gonna go on stage like a surprise and just like announce myself and you know, just shoot the shit. And I got so nervous because I'm like, do they know who the fuck I am? <laughs> like, am I gonna walk out there and be like, oh, what's going on? And so, um, so I, I was backstage and I came out and then happily the crowd was really excited to see me and uh, you know, the, the, the rest of it. Um, but there, it was really awesome to see, frankly, like, a, you know, an Asian rapper, like in this case, like thousands of, uh, hip hop fans who were there who were almost exclusively Asian, I'd say, <laughs> and whatnot. But of course, none of that stuff existed when you and I were growing up. Yeah, none of it. I mean, I guess like, uh, you know, um. It was hard. And so, yeah, you don't, we didn't really have that. So yeah, I agree with you. I think that it was a bit of the idea of trying to find some form of masculinity that made sense, right? Where you just don't want to be thought of as a dork, right? Um, and that was basically it. Yes, that was really the, the thing to avoid. It's like, don't want, don't be the Asian nerd. So anything to avoid that, anything you could right. latch on to. So in my case, one of the things too, I felt pressure around was Sports? Did, did 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 that happen to you in North Carolina? Uh, and, until middle school or so, I was pretty good at sports, and then it I hit some sort of cliff where I was suddenly very bad. <laughs> I was no longer good at them, and so I think that during my formative years, I played a lot of sports, and I do think that that helped quite a bit, right? And then by the time I was in 
ninth grade or something like that, it wouldn't have mattered so much. And then I just became like a kind of like stoner guy on the, um, you know, on the debate team. <laughs> just, I don't, I don't even know what it was, but it was just like, that was sort of my thing, you know? Um, and, uh, who listened to a lot of rap. Um, and that was basically it. But yeah, I do think that there was some, you know, it was interesting cause there's like these two, there's like uh, there weren't that many Asian kids at my high school, right? Like maybe five in my grade. And two of them were super jocks. Like one of them ended up playing soccer at wow. Carolina, you know, like starting when he was a fresh. So he was like one of the best high school soccer players in the country. And, uh, he was like this five foot six Japanese guy. And then there was my friend, Alan, who lived down the street from me, who was like, you know, more sort of nerdy and, and sort of your stereotypical nerd guy. And so, yeah, it was, uh, you know, you, you always kind of look around when you're in those situations. You're like, what's, what's the other Asian dudes doing? <laughs> right. And it's like also this form of betrayal that you feel terrible about when you're doing it, you know, because you're just like, why do I have to do this? Why am I doing this? What if I just didn't do this? But then it's hard to stop doing that. Right. And so that, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. Uh, I've had to ask you this actually, like, do you think that like, I mean, like you and I are similar in the same age, we grew up in similar situations. I think that we have similar sort of paths, right? Uh, do you think like what, you have kids, like, do you think your kids are going to like, I, I, I almost feel like my kid is not going to, is like growing up in Completely a different, different, almost at different least, America. At least for, for me. Right. Like, uh, I, so I, right. I look at the way my kids are growing up, uh, and it's totally night and day to the way I grew up, my brother grew up. Because my, my parents came in, they were immigrants, they didn't know anything. And so, you know, we just like kind of showed up clueless uh, to the extent that we knew about ourselves as Asians. It was like just getting picked on and bullied all the time by various kids. And then, you know, like <laughs> right. just feeling like your place in the country is always being questioned. Uh, your masculinity is always being questioned. My kids don't seem to get any of that. Like, you know, they're, they're just coming up there. Uh, I, I joke and just talk about how soft my kids are. My kids are so soft. And uh, I know you have a girl, so in your case, <laughs> you know, maybe it's a slightly different, um, like, uh, calculation. Uh, but I, I have a joke, because when I was running for president, I talk about how we're automating away the jobs, and it's making us insane, and the rest of it. And so I'd show a picture of my kids and be like, my kids are way too soft to survive the Mad Max apocalypse <laughs> that's coming. We got to keep our shit together <laughs> <laughs> for their sake. And, like, and then there's a picture of my boys, and they just do look really, really uh, very sheltered. Um, so, uh, it, it sometimes upsets me, Jay, but then I'm just like, yeah, you know, it's a different generation. It's a different time. Uh, you know, like they're just, uh, you know, comparing their childhood to mine, it really is very different. My wife and I have a joke from before where we would pretend to be, uh, laundromat owners who didn't speak English or whatever. And then, and then just like, you know, or, or like have, have them raised by like, or else they'd like <laughs> pop out with their 18 and be like, Hey, guess what? It turns out, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think about it too. Cause it's just like, uh, you think like, all right, you know, I went through all this stuff and man, I was really, you know, it sort of, it, it was horrible, but that's why I'm so tough today, you know? And then I think, and then I just think, so is what I'm saying is that I hope that my daughter goes through like long periods of racist bullying. <laughs> you know, it's like, of course not, you know, but you do have, I think that's like the thing between people like us who went through that position and now have children who are probably not going to go through that just because the country is different or the circumstances in which we raise our families need. are different you know because the you know like are my, very my kids are growing right. up in uh, manhattan and going um to, to schools and like that's a different vibe than you know the upstate new york right. um right. school i grew up in uh, and the rest of it it is a different time right. but you know we, we end up in these enclaves too in our own way uh you know because our circumstances are different right. than our right. parents and we do different kinds of work People think I'm a very, very upbeat guy, which I appreciate a great deal, but we all struggle. We all get down in the dumps. And when you are down and facing some issues that you want to talk to someone about, the fact is your friends and family don't really want to hear about your stuff. <laughs> They'll hear about it once. And then after that, I'll be like, oh, you know, uh, get someone else, which is why BetterHelp is so important. BetterHelp is on-demand professional therapy whenever you need it. You reach out. It's totally confidential and professional and affordable. We swear by our sponsor, BetterHelp, 
tear it forward because it actually lives up to its name. It's better help than your friends and family because they actually want to help you and listen to what you're going through. I want you, we all want to start living a better, happier life. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash yang. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. You can do it. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash yang. You'll be glad you did and your loved ones will be glad too. I loved the book because I felt like you just cut to the core of a lot of things around identity. And there's like this predominant racial set of narratives that you kind of questioned or poked holes in. Um, and I thought the the maybe like the biggest example of that is when you talked about the uh, the treatment of the beatings of Asian elders during COVID uh, and, and how uh, there were some uh, narratives that, the press just completely would not touch. Um, and then you put them in these terms, and I'm going to read at least one of them. It says, uh, white liberals talk about ending racism, but they don't mean us. In fact, they will actually deny us justice to protect black assailants uh, with the observation that a significant number, maybe even a preponderance of the attacks on Asian elders were by uh African Americans in Oakland and New York City and other things. Um, and then you write, if the roles were reversed and Asian men were randomly attacking and even killing old black people, there would be nationwide protests. I had never seen that put in those terms. Uh, and I, I frankly am grateful that you did it or that someone did it um, because there was such like a disconnect where uh, if there was an issue of um, violence against Asians, like, like there, there was a lack of coverage or discussion about um, like the, the nature of the, uh, or the identity of some of the people that were doing the attacking. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I want to say like, you know, in that section, I was trying to encapsulate what a lot of the thoughts of Asian people at the time were, right? And so I'm not necessarily speaking as myself there, right? But I am trying to say this is what people were thinking, right? Like, like these are the thoughts that pe that people, especially in immigrant enclaves, like right people who are recent immigrants, right? Like th when they try and understand the racial calculus in this country, this is just something that they come up across, right? Like they see these videos and they go and they say, okay, well it seems like a you know the last three videos have been black assailants, right? And um, like where's the outrage, right? And then they think about like what they what they went uh, sort of the 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 summer before, right? And they think about the protests around George Floyd, and they just think, why are these two things not equal, right? Like why 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 does the country not care about us in the same sort of way? And like what are where what are our leaders, our supposed leaders, saying? Right now, I don't think that necessarily like, these are productive thoughts to have. In fact, I would say many of them are unproductive, right? They're not contextualized in American history in some ways. Uh, and I also think that like, uh, you know, there is some, there is like a danger in expressing them publicly, right? Like I, I think that like it, it can be destructive, right? Like it's, it's not something that everyone doesn't need to sort of be this gigantic truth teller. The truth is going to end up causing a lot of division, but now, were people having those thoughts, though? Oh, absolutely. You know, of course they were having those thoughts because that's just the human sort of nature in terms of like, well, why aren't things fair for me? Why am I not getting the same sort of treatment? And yeah, I, th I think that that was a very predominant thought at the time, right? And I think it's still a predominant thought. I think it affects politics, right? And I think it affects the way in which people think about the Democratic Party and progressives in, in particular, right? Like they think, well, you know, these are supposed to be the anti-racist people, you know, like why are they not protecting us? And you start to see messaging in Asian communities, you start to see messaging online that is essentially just saying like, hey, you know, these people don't actually have our backs, right? Like they're trying to, they're trying to take away our test schools, right? They're trying to keep us out of Harvard. Uh, they don't care when we're getting beat up in the streets because they don't want to criticize other minorities, you know, that, that like, and like, I don't know, that is a very powerful message, right? It's a powerful message because I think that uh, 
that it has enough, it sort of goes right into the sort of lizard brain of a lot of Asian people, right? Where they're having these thoughts that they don't want to admit that they're having. And it says like, it's okay to have these thoughts. This is the truth. And like, I think that from that, you can create like a very powerful reactionary type of politics that frankly terrifies me. You know, like, I, I don't think that we should base our, uh, politics on grievances and anger. Right. But I, I, I just see it happening right now. And, um, you know, you can see it in the polls after Virginia, you can see it in the polls in, the, in, in New York. Uh, you know, you can see it almost everywhere right now that there's some swing coming. Well, I, I'm certainly with you. Like, I also want to get away from people uh, grinding axes uh, or, or having these grievances and division. Uh, you know, I certainly, I hate trying to blame um, gr large groups of people for like a particular action, especially along the lines of race. You know, it's like, like if someone does right. something, it's like that. That's not like all people of that race. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, and uh, in terms of this, the the violence against Asian elders, like I made the case. Look, half of this is being perpetrated, documented by people who are struggling with mental illness. So let's focus on getting people more services. Uh, that's something that we should all be able to get behind. Um, I I found myself frustrated that we were all trying to make it seem like. If we had like social media campaigns saying, you know, Asians are people and like racism is bad, like that'll do the trick. And I was like, look, 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 like this is, you know, like it's not like someone's going to see that campaign and be like, oh, like that now, you know, like now my desire to, to beat an Asian grandma is gone. You know, it's like it, it's just someone who is really, really uh, in a very bad way themselves. And then and they're unable to uh, check what's like a nasty, dangerous, sometimes even um, violent impulse. Um, so I, I'm with you on trying to, to go another direction. And I think that one of the goals to try and get there would be just being able to accept a degree of complexity. It's like you have these press driven narratives that are always uh, to your your major point, just so binary in nature. It's just like this is the narrative we're going with. And then anything that, that doesn't fit that narrative, we're going to just kind of hand wave away. <laughs> but if it's in that narrative, then we're just going to go full bore. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that stuff, like, you know, like that's basically just been the crisis of uh, my intellectual life for the past two years. It's just like just frustration with that type of thinking, right? Which is just that if it doesn't, if, you, if it's not one way, then you must be on the other side, right? And so like when you're assessing the attacks on, on old Asian people, right, like, uh, there was at the beginning, there was this thing that was just like, these are about white supremacy, right? Like this is all white supremacy. And it's just like, I don't know if that makes sense to me. You know, it certainly doesn't make sense to the people who are being attacked. And in those communities, like if you told them, they like, what's white supremacy have to do with this? Also, like maybe they would even say, what's white supremacy, right? Like these are immigrant communities. And, um, and they're experiencing it in a very different way. And so then if you try and describe the way and through reporting and talking to these people, like the way that they are feeling, right? And saying that, look, this is a complex thing, you know? Some of it might make you very uncomfortable. You might dislike a lot of these people and think that they're racist, all that's fine, right? But we shouldn't describe it with the, with, as it's something it's not just because it makes, you know, a certain type of liberal person comfortable, right? Because that's all that is, right, in the end. It's like, it's a lot of sort of elite, Asians sort of getting together and just being like, what's the most comfortable way that we can describe this? And just like, oh, well, the most comfortable way that we can describe this and still keep our sort of progressive bona fides is to say it's about white supremacy, do hashtag campaigns, right? Talk about like the times we were bullied as children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to try and make it about us, right? Instead of the, the, the sort of like unsavory Asians, right? That we don't want to talk about, right? And in a way it's like this, is, it's an act of mass erasure, right? Because like, and it even erases the victims themselves. and. I found that extremely frustrating throughout that time. And so that's why I wrote that chapter. I was trying to be, I, I'm not saying that like, we have to think of it, we, we should start a race war or that even not. It's saying the opposite that, of you what know, you're saying, that, I think. That it's yeah. right. And just saying like, we gotta just be honest about this, you know, like we gotta, and we, and we should listen to the, not, we don't have to do the things that they say, but we should at least like accurately assess what they say, you know, like, and then you have this sort of narrative that it's like a bunch of people uh, being like, oh, we're all doctors, and so why would you attack us? You know, I'm just like, we're not all doctors. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like also, what does that have to do with anything? So, like, yeah, I don't know. There's a class, and there's like an immigration status element to it that uh, that I think is never talked about. And so, I hope that the book would sort of jab a finger at that. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, and I think that's one of the primary messages of the book is that you describe uh, children of the Immigration Act of 1965, which is definitely me and you, <laughs> people whose highly right, educated right. parents were let in when, when that was the preference. Uh, and then you have the more recent immigrants who don't think of themselves as Asian American, maybe often aren't engaged politically, they may not speak English very well. Uh, and there's a concern of the former group that's around cultural issues, representation in media, uh, po politics, uh, and the attempted creation of an Asian American political identity. Uh, and then there's the lived experience of the vast majority of people who uh, don't have those experiences or advantages or that sense of collective identity. People who are more like your parents. Maybe they identify themselves as Koreans in America or Cambodians in America or whatever the, the group happens to be. Uh, and, and that your recommendation is that uh, Asian Americans in the former group, the educated group, should be taking on the true issues that are facing uh, the latter group, which, uh, which have been suffering in many ways, especially over the last number of months. Like that your recommendation is to make common cause with, uh, with that group, which, is, by the way, is probably larger. Uh, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the example that I give in the book and the one that I speak about quite a bit is that, like, after the Georgia Spa massacres, right, which is this, you know, traumatic experience, I think, an extremely traumatic experience for a lot of Asian Americans, uh, it, it was about a day of people talking about the actual tragedy. And then in the mainstream media and in all the messaging channels, like, the conversation abruptly shifts, right? It becomes... A lot of people like you and me, right, who sort of grew up with educated parents and had went to good schools and now occupy these sort of elite places talking about ourselves, right? And what do we talk about? We talk about like microaggressions in the corporate workplace, right? We talk about uh, the time when our I certainly do not try to talk about those, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, no, you did it. You did it. I said people, people who grew up like us, right, um, who occupy these positions. And so... And then I was thinking about it at the time, and I was like, well, why is this happening? You know, these, these people are dead, right? These people uh, are, you know, they are involved in sex work, which I'm not saying anything bad about sex work, but it's a precarious life, right? It's one that needs protection, right? Um, they are all recent immigrants. Like, they're not people who were born here in the United States. They're people who are living in almost in extremely economically pre precarious conditions, right? They're not people who, like, are worried about... The, the way in which they're treated at a diversity seminar, for example, at Google or something like that. And yet these are the narratives that pro proliferate everywhere, right? Like the sort of upper middle class, like uh, Asian spokesperson, Asian American spokespeople start to take over and it becomes about them. And I think that that is like a, I think that is a, I think that's a path to nowhere. You know, I think that it leads to zero solidarity with other groups, right? Like I think that, uh, that it makes it so that other groups think that like our are that that all Asians have no problems except for what role Scarlett Johansson stole from one of us, you know? It's like, who wants to be in solidarity with a group like that, right? Like, if those are the expressed concerns. And so the book is more about, like, uh, or the argument that you're talking about in the book is just that, like, look, we need to, like, we need to start thinking about people who are actually less fortunate, you know? We have to think about these immigrant communities. We have to think about... The people like people in Georgia who we say we care so much about, but also are erasing from this narrative almost immediately and replacing with us. Right. And so um, I think that's a very difficult thing to do, but I don't really see any other pathway for like whatever this thing that we call Asian American identity. Oh, is. I'm going to suggest another pathway. Uh, you might not like it, but I'm just going to throw okay. this out there. Uh, so in, in a way, it's like Ronnie Chang's recommendation where he talked about how we're going to be the referee. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. So you, you have a country that's coming apart and I'm going to propose that Asian Americans become the glue, that we become the unifying group that's trying to solve the real problems, keep everyone together. Uh, and when you talk about who we fight for, I, I mean, I, I love the idea of, of trying to... Uh, elevate and embrace the cause of recent immigrant uh, workers in part, you know, because I mean, the, the, they remind me of my family and everyone, I, I'm sure like a lot of people right. um, feel the same way. Uh, but I, I want us to try to make the country whole to see like America's interests as ours and say to folks too, that if the reverse is true of this country disintegrates, which by the way, it's on track to do, uh, it's going to be terrible for everyone. But it's going to be terrible for us. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's my case. I don't know what you think. 
I think that it's, I think that there's a lot of Asian people who could fill that role, right? And it's like something that I think like, I don't know, it's something that Wesley Yang writes about too, right? Where he talks about how like, you know, like the Asian male is sort of like the every male, right? Because like he doesn't really find any identification with any sort of culture. And so he just becomes sort of the default, right? Like I think that, that there is some in that, but I also just think that like, I don't know. Can you really like? Wh- wh- do you think these immigrant populations are going to get right? Like, I, I guess I'm just having a hard time uh, picturing like how they would be mobilized in that sort of way, right? How they would see it in their best interest. Well, if you look at these immigrant pro- populations, and you described in your book about your parents, it's like these came in and just wanted to make a living. Right. You know, it's like wanted right. to like right. made a decent life, and I think that's what motivates a lot of folks. Uh, you know, in in a big way, to me, I I, I want to create the conditions where that still is true for people who show up and, you know, they don't need to worry about being Asian and, you know, getting um, beaten up in some way. Uh, it, it, it's like a functional America. Uh, it allows them to fulfill that ambition, <laughs> I, I, I suppose. Right, right. Uh, I, I, yeah, I guess I just think that that um, for me, the political work is always just going to be about um figuring out ways to have solidarity with other groups, right? And uh, specifically like black and Latino groups, right? Like in, in America. And I, I think that for a lot of Asian Americans uh, who are, you know, in my position, for example, where they're, they're okay financially, and, um, but they are always trying to think about themselves, how am I going to fit within this progressive space, right? I think those Asian Americans don't necessarily care about what white people think about them, you know? I don't really care what white people think about me. I'm 41 years old, you know, I'm sort of over that, right? I think that the thing that those Asian Americans think about quite a bit though is what black people think about them, right? Like how, because they see that as the only way to sort of have a type of solidarity and type of politics that they can be proud of, right? And and that I think that that's why there's so much sort of like care around some of these issues around these attacks, for example, right? Like people are really, really upset about saying something that they feel will be treasonous to that type of solidarity. Now, the contention I make in the book is that that sort of solidarity is very fraught, right? Like that, that outside of places like the academy or outside of places like, I don't know, corporate boards or something like that, or diversity spaces, like it's not, it, it's, it's very difficult to say that it's there, you dude, know, if no, we're having no, an dude, honest conversation about uh, it. In, in the New York mayoral race, a new phrase was coined um, which someone used people of color and then someone said, well, like, you know, Yang's of color. And they were like, no, no, people of more color. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And it seems like every day a new term is created to sort of like push Asian people out of like this coalition. Right. And so I think that I've, my sense is just like we need to just kind of be honest about that. Right. And if our goal, which I think should be our goal, like, I mean, this totally like this is like the purpose of my life's work basically is like can we build meaningful coalitions with those people can we have meaningful solidarity with like uh black and latino when, when, when you say that it's say, that i, I need... would say can we build meaningful coalitions with people with anyone like i take anyone right right sure but like but you know for me for me it really is like a, a center around like you know like what what would be like a sort of politics of dissent, right? Like I, I'm much more to the left than you politically, right? So, um, and I would just say that, you know, you need to start doing work that resembles work that other people are doing, right? And I think that there are a lot of Asian American activists who are doing this type of work right now, right? They're totally ignored, right? They're, they're sort of, but they're doing work that's like kind of like helping laundry workers or helping bike messengers, whatever. Like um, I did who comes know, to delivery, mind. Delivery drivers. Right, right, right. And I mean, I, th- I think that like early on, like when you're in your like 20s or something like that, you're pretty involved in this sort of stuff, weren't you? Um, or like you're involved in Asian American yeah, spaces. Yeah, right? yeah, quite, quite, uh, quite a lot. Yeah, so like I think that um, that if there, I just think that that would be a much more appealing type of work for people to do. It would be more satisfying, but at the same, and I think that it would have a lot of overlaps with the type of work that like, uh, you know, coalitional black Latino activists are doing as well. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to have all of this be determined by activists, right? A lot of this is just work in your daily life. And I think that's the only path, right? But it's difficult. It's difficult. Like the end of the book is me just sort of expressing my own 
doubts that this will ever work, right? <laughs> like that, because it, we're so incentivized by capitalism. Yeah. Well, I, I, the takeaway I took was, was, you know, you present a couple of different choices and then you're like, well, you know, we kind of need to forge our own identity and our own path, which is something I agree with. Um, uh, th there are a couple of things I, I wanted to make sure and cover. There was one line that just made me laugh out loud and I want to share it just because I thought it was so rough. Um, you're talking about this guy, Doug, uh, who makes his own pilot in Hollywood, uh, um, and uh, you you write about how people don't really pick up on his story, even the Asian Americans that traditionally complain about depictions of media. And then, uh, you know, he does his homegrown pilot. They just don't seem to care. And then you write something and said, this, Doug and I understand, is a pathetic story. But most Asian American stories are pathetic. Uh, and I just laughed out loud. And my wife was like, what are you laughing at? And then I like had her had her read that. Uh, like, what were you thinking when you wrote that? Oh, man. Like, we're, uh, you know. I mean, you know this, like, people don't really care about our problems, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Especially Asian dudes, you know? And um, a lot of, I've, I've been asked a lot about who this book was written for, and it's not something you think about when you're writing a book. You just think, well, I got to get to the next page, and, oh, I'm really enjoying writing this part. This was really interesting. Like, you don't have this, like, picture of who you're writing for when you do it. Maybe some people do, but I certainly don't. Um... But I thought about it and I was like, you know, I think a lot of it is written for sort of, uh, I was listening to this podcast and, you know, one of the things that the people said I thought was actually quite astute and they said, well, I think he, this book is for sort of not online Asian people, right? Like people who don't follow politics that care, like people like my sister, my sister doesn't have any social media, right? She um, must be, she must but be it's also written, I think. She must be, she must be like, what's wrong with my life? <laughs> oh yeah, no, she, she just goes, she does a lot of hiking and Sounds terrible. surfing and hangs out with her kid. Yeah, she doesn't, she's never triggered by like, some, <laughs> some dumb tweet she read. <laughs> so ignorant. Uh, um, okay, continue, no, no. continue. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's one of them, but I don't know. I think in a lot of ways it's written for like, uh, you know, like I, I think it's just written for people who feel like kind of, fucked up by you know um feeling rejected and and a lot of that is is based on being like an asian dude i think like you know you just sort of feel like oh, i don't know like nobody really cares about our feelings i think that asian women go through a different version of that right but um and so i'm not discounting that i just think like i don't know it's like it's kind of like there's no way to tell these stories without people just sort of laughing at us, you know? And so, and be like, oh man, you know, like you're such a loser. I'm going to share a story that, that, that this is what's going on in my household because this might make you laugh. Um, so I, right. I've, I've run for a couple of offices, you know, been through some things. Uh, I, I, my general attitude is that um, no one gives a shit about, you know, like, like what I'm going through. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I just try and, you know, keep, keep that. Um, off, uh, off to the side. Uh, and then uh, I went over to a, a friend's house um, and she bought my books, very kind, and had me sign them, uh, you know. Um, and then among the books were some books of poetry by Andrew Yang that I did not write. Uh, there's apparently a guy named Andrew Yang has like written like several books of poems. Uh, and some people... Right think it's me and the way it's identified it's like you can't tell you know anything about it so the guy's name is andrew yang and it's all this like bleak poetry about you know his struggles and like you know like the darkness and shit like that um and my wife finds this hysterically funny she like goes out and buys the books of poems <laughs> and is like i really want you to read these aloud um but right, but there was right. a part of me that was very uncomfortable, which is like, oh man, some people are gonna like buy these poems and think like I'm like writing these poems. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel that. Yeah, yeah, because you don't want to be. There's this sort of mask we put on, right? Like where it's just I don't know, like stuff that like Adrian Tomine writes about, right? Or um, it's sort of like, well, uh, we can't really, like, there's no sort of way to tell these stories that is broadly sympathetic that won't be that we know that most people aren't cringing at you know and so um and i don't know that that's sort of what i meant it's just like the asian male story of struggle is very it's real to me <laughs> you know, it's real to my friend doug like we hurt you know but then there's also this other thing you know it's just like 
Well, it's tough because nobody gives a shit and everyone's going to laugh at us you know, if, we, if we try to be earnest about it. And so I don't know. I deal with it, you know. I don't know. Self-medication and, you know, general cynical affect or whatever. But, you know, it's it's a lot of like, it's a lot of like, you know, it's dealing with this core thing. It, you know, it's weird to write a book when you when that's your conclusion about America, right? Which is that like nobody really gives a shit about anything I think, right? While also sort of occupying a very high position in the media, right? Um, and uh, then I th sometimes I think, wow, this piece got a lot of traffic. People really do care what I think, you know? And then I'm just like, no, <laughs> you know? like it's just nobody gives a shit. So yeah, that, that's what I meant by that line. It's just like, you know, our stories are kind of pathetic. Well, the, well, there were a lot of lines like that in the book that just struck me as unflinchingly honest. Uh, I appreciated your eye on a lot of complex issues in a way that I thought really cut to the heart of a lot of things. I shared a lot of it. I mean, you and I have a lot in common. Uh, I think identifying right. the different uh, sets of experiences of people who, you know, might have access to certain opportunities um, uh, or, or educational levels and, and whatnot, and then trying to lump us all together um, uh, is part of the problem, really, is that like in, in America, and you're a counter example to this, which is one reason I appreciate you, but um, that it seems like race is being try is being used as a bludgeon in so many ways. <laughs> you know, it's like going around and being like, "What's right. that? You know, you're Latino, then you should be voting this way. What you voted that way, then like, what the hell's wrong with you? You know, it's like so, something's going on. Like there, there, there is like this segmentation and this division. Uh, and maybe the most important contribution your book made was like, look, we're human beings. Like there's no monolith. There's no Asian American <laughs> identity that somehow like, you know, has us all looking and, and thinking a certain way. Uh, and so I, I appreciated it. You know, when I was running for president, people would ask me about my identity all the time. And I just, you know, part of it's like, look, I'm, I'm like, I'm a human being. <laughs> you know, it's like, I certainly never like right. claimed to representing like, you know, millions of people's point of view. <laughs> it's, uh, Did you feel that pressure? Like, because I, you know, I will say that I heard you like, uh, I had heard, my friend had told me about you, but this was very early on, and then you did the Sam Harris podcast, and then I listened to it, you know, and I was like, who is this guy? You know, like, I was, and, like, part of me was like, I've never heard an Asian guy like this in my life, <laughs> you know, like, sort of, like, very upbeat, and, and, and uh, you know, like, sort of just being like, these are my ideas, without sort of talking about identity at all, right? Like, even though you were a guy who was running for president, this sort of, like, you know, you know, I think you would admit, like, you know, not traditional path towards becoming the president right? like, uh, <laughs> well, so I was like, very, admit I was, that <laughs> like what a revelation y'all continue, continue. Uh, and so I was I remember listening to it and just be like wow you know like I just don't know any Asian people like this right like uh and or anyone who would do this right like that was the other thing that I was thinking it was like I don't know did you feel like you had to clear away some of that stuff because I that's that's why I was surprised when you know I'd be talking to some of our mutual friends or something like that and they'd be like you know, like when Andrew was uh, in his 20s, he was like really involved in a lot of Asian American space stuff, you know, and he was doing a lot of stuff like, I don't know, did you feel like you had to separate yourself from that? I, I don't mean to interview you now, but I, you know, I was just curious about it. No, not at yeah. all, man. It's good fun. Um, so uh, I, I tell a joke in Asian American circles, uh, which you will understand. I say the first time you heard about me, your first reaction was, please let him not be terrible. Oh, 100 <laughs> percent. When you your first debate, that was all I was thinking, you know, because I was just like your first presidential debate. I was like, please don't make him embarrassing. Please don't make him embarrassing. Please don't make him embarrassing. That was the only thing going through my head. You're right. Yeah, you got yeah, me. And that, so, yeah. I mean, that's the way we, we think. I told my team as much, too. I was right. like, look, like the Asians will come after I demonstrate <laughs> that other people are into it. And then... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so when you ask about, you know, my, my approach, I genuinely was just driven by these big ideas around uh, automation, AI, and, and technology, universal basic income. And I, I saw it as my service to society, uh, maybe even humanity, to say, look, like we have to mainstream the, these ideas. 
But a lot of the stuff I learned along the way, Jay, is just how messed up our treatment of a lot of these issues uh, is because of race. Um, and I'll share a story with you that, uh, you know, I, I share every once in a while. So I was on a panel with a guy named Michael Tubbs, who is the mayor of Stockton, California, young, black, inspirational figure, a friend now. Um, but after the panel, he leaned over to me and said, Andrew, you can say shit I could never get away with because if a young black mayor was walking around saying, give everyone a thousand bucks a month, like, you know, they would laugh me out of the room. But if the if the magical Asian man from the future says it, then everyone's like, oh, I guess we should listen. <laughs> we should hear this out. So yeah, so there, yeah. there was like this identity element to uh, my campaign, but it was not me talking about my identity um, in large part because that's not what I was there to talk about. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? Um, but uh, but I'm you know, cognizant of the fact that you couldn't separate out who I am from uh, the message of the campaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think you're right. I think that there, I don't know. It, I, I've thought a lot about the way that people thought about you because, you know, you were Asian. And I don't know if I ever came to a very good conclusion about it. But I, I, I think I agree with the mayor from Stockton, right, that it did give you this sort of like futuristic thing, right? Like you did become like, you know, this guy that, you know, it sort of drops down. It's like, here are some cool ideas, you know, and, and, and you can do that in ways that he can, I think. I think you're right. Yeah. Well, um, Jay, uh, I just want to close on this because I, I just want to share this experience as someone who's written a book. So you wrote a novel. It's a very personal experience. And then when you put it out in the world, you do feel like, oh, I hope people like it. Um, and then this is a nonfiction book that's at least somewhat autobiographical. So there's a lot of personal investment, too. You're like, oh, you know, like as someone who's written a, a few books now, it's very hard to just be like, oh, like, uh, you know, I don't care about people's reaction to this book. Like you do care. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, you use that all this time. Um, so how, how has the reception been and what has your experience been? Because I, I know that there was at least some um, some stuff that that, uh, you know, I saw in passing. Yeah, there's a group of uh, not all, not a lot, but there is a small group of Asian American studies professors who are very proudly proclaiming that they're going to refuse to read the book. Right. And um, I didn't understand that. I don't think I'll ever understand that. But, you know, I will say that within our community that there is quite a bit of gatekeeping, right? And the reason why there's a lot of gatekeeping is very sympathetic is because, you know, like we said before, nobody really cares, you know? And so, like, the market is so small that people feel, you know, it's a crabs in a bucket type of mentality. People feel like they have to crawl, crawl to the top, right? But we're all killing each other. And so I think that's part of it. I will say that the first piece I ever wrote for zero dollars that was published on my friend's blog in the comments to that blog, an Asian American studies professor showed up and was lecturing me about all the things that I wasn't referencing and all the people that I didn't, you know, all the things that I didn't read and all the things that I didn't cite, right? This has been my entire career, right? That, that uh, a group of, of tenured professors basically and, 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 and people who have very, you know, think of themselves as very, very progressive people have always had a bad reaction to me because my general thesis has always just been that Asian ident American identity doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to most people. It doesn't make sense to most poor Asians. And that it is really just sort of like, a, you know, like it's a thing that mostly deals with like elite people who go to elite colleges and that, you know, that, that, that is upsetting. Um, and so the bad, you know, there, those people have, you know, somewhat big online audiences and people always like fights. Right. And so that, that sort of colored the first week of the book being out in a way that was, I don't know, for a while I thought it was funny, you know, but then it, it, it did make me mad because a lot of the stuff that they were saying was untrue. Right. Like they, so they were saying that, uh, the book has, that I've never that I am not connected to and don't report on immigrant neighborhoods. It's crazy. Half the books you know, about immigrant neighborhoods. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Have the, right. Also, my entire career has been like reporting about, about immigrant neighborhoods, right? Uh, about flushing, about, uh, you know, like Tibetan populations in Oakland, like, like places that, that, that people don't even know have immigrant neighborhoods. Like that, that's been my career. So it's just a lie, you know? And it's such a lie that I don't even know how to respond to it. Just be like, you're describing somebody else. And then there was a claim that like I hadn't engaged enough in Asian American scholarship, which like if you just open the or the an activism, which if you just open the book and you look at the table of contents, there's two chapters on Asian American activism. You know, so it's just like these. I didn't know how to respond to it because uh, it was just lies, right? And so um, I don't know. It's very unpleasant when people lie about you on the internet and try and ruin like a. Uh, 
you know, a book launch for you. But at the same time, you know, like, uh, I do have some like sense of like perspective on it, right? This is a small group of people. They've been, uh, you know, this is not the first time that, that, that this group has tried to, you know, really criticize me. I knew they were going to criticize me and, and I sort of expected it. I just didn't expect it to sort of become such a narrative there or for them to sort of, you know, start saying things that aren't true. And I d certainly did not expect a bunch of academics to refuse to read a book, right, publicly. Like, that's the weirdest part about it. Yeah, that, that, that seems kind of like kind of the opposite of their profession. It's like this book, <laughs> you know, like will never enter my brain. It's like, well, you know, I thought your entire thing was, uh, you know, learning. <laughs> right, right. And there's all these accusations. Their general accusation was that, like, I was I have such a huge platform. I'm sure you get this, too. You know, and it's like you are the only Asian person who is allowed to talk. And so you need to be better. And it's just like, it's not true. You know, like there's so many Asian writers right now. There are a lot of different voices. I'm one person, you know, do I have a large platform? Sure. You know, so do a lot of other people. And, and they write all the time. Like they were basically making it seem like I was the only Asian writer to ever write in the New York Times, which, you know, I actually find quite offensive to all the other, all my colleagues who are Asian who work in the New York Times. You know, so um, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I didn't really, I had a week where, or a few days where I was mad about it. And then my mom called me and I was sitting in the bathtub and she was like, she started, you know, I pick up the phone and she starts screaming in Korean, which is when I know that she's like actually very mad at me. And she was like, stop responding to people on Twitter. <laughs> you know, you're going to go crazy. <laughs> um, all in Korean. And then, and then after that, I stopped. And since then, it's been fine. I will say 99.9% .9 of the response I've gotten from the book has been from people um, who sent me heartfelt emails or tweeted about it or uh, sent me DMs or, you know, even called me people that I've known from a long time. And it's all been, you know, it's been not everyone agrees with everything in the book, right? It's not a book that is meant to have a lot of people agree with everything. But uh, those types of conversations have been great. And that's, you know, like that's most of my experience with the book, honestly, right? Like the stuff that happens on Twitter. Well, deservedly so, Jay. I mean, the things I'd say about the book is it's honest, it's personal, uh, it's edifying, uh, you know, even from the glimpses she got now, my wife, Evelyn, wants to read it. Um, so you deserve the, So you deserve the praise. You okay. should be really proud of it. Uh, and anyone who does something, you know, in, in my mind, like it is uh, a plus, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I don't think that, that that's one of the, the problems of today, really. So um, hats off to you. Uh, I'm really excited for you. I'm excited for more people to pick up The Loneliest Americans, uh, which uh, I found to be a phenomenal read, uh, fun too. Like I, I did laugh a number of times. Uh, it's just brutal, man. It's just like brutally honest. Like uh, may maybe someone will make a movie out of some parts of it. Uh, like I, I yeah, enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. I uh, thank you. The honesty part is the nicest compliment of you know. I I was trying to write a book that I don't know. I don't understand. It's I have a very sort of relationship with writing where it's I don't. It doesn't really linger, you know, for me. Like I get it out on the page and it's out. And so under those conditions, I feel like it's okay to be as honest as possible because you're not like worried about what people think about you because you're, you don't even think about it. And, you know, it's almost like this sociopathic, like break, right? Once it's out, then I, you know, like it's in the world, it's not really about me anymore. And so I tried to be as honest as possible. And, um, you know, if anyone, I hope that people just take that away from it, that, you know, like I'm trying my best. They to really that. should stuff. I had never seen in writing before. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, and, you know, keep doing it, man. Like anything you produce, uh, like you can count me in as a fan uh, because even if I don't agree with it, I'm going to say you. like, you know, this is a, a very, very unflinching look at the world. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.